you've got a Bible there, then good on you. That's awesome. Uh, let me get this all set up. How do I turn this on again? That's right. Technology is not my biggest friend. Uh, here we go. I want to just uh, have a look. I want to start with a bit of a story out of Acts chapter, chapter 19. Uh, Acts chapter 19. And uh, we're going to continue to talk a bit today about uh, this community and, and crowd concept that we've been uh, looking at. In Acts chapter 19, there's this interesting, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Acts 19, there's this interesting story. Let me just turn to it and find it. Acts chapter 19. Where are we? Just talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, that's right. What have you done on the weekend, Daniel? What's anything? Yeah, well, there you go. It's been a busy one. Okay, Acts chapter 19. So in Acts chapter 19, we've got the story of uh, uh, Paul and Apollos uh, in Ephesus, and there's a riot that takes place in Ephesus, and these guys go in preaching about Jesus, and the local community don't like that, so they get a bit uptight about that, and so on. Uh, and then as this crowd gathers, it says in, uh, starting in verse 23, it says, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way, which is what the church used to be called, the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines for Artemis, which is one of the gods, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. And he called them together along with the workers in related trades and said, you know, my friends, we receive a good income from this business. It makes me question, was it really about the worship of this apparent God or are you more worried about the economy of not being able to sell idols? Like how, how connected are you to God if it's just about the money and that's what disturbs you? And he goes on, he says, you see, and here this guy Paul, he's convincing people, he's leading people astray in large numbers in Ephesus uh, and in the whole province of Asia, he's taking them away. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. In a nutshell, we're going to lose money if we don't stop this. That's what he's trying to say. When they heard this, they were furious, began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. In verse 29, soon the whole city was in an uproar. People seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's travelling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theatre together. So there's this crowd that goes running into the theatre in a frenzy. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. They were afraid that Paul would get ripped apart if he went in there. In verse 31, even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him, don't go in there. And verse 32 says this, it says, The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. Interesting. There's this massive crowd that gathers together. Some are shouting this and some are shouting that. But it says that in this assembly, it says that a lot of people that were there, they actually had no idea why they were even there. Now the word used here, assembly, is the Greek word ecclesia. It's the same word that you'll find translated when the writers talk about church. When they say the word church, it's the same word. So the word church was never a religious word. It was not something that was connected to religion. It was connected to more civic uh, gatherings and meetings of people that gathered together to make decisions and so on. Um, it, it, and so it's, it's referred to as an assembly in many places. But what fascinated me when I read this this week was here's this crowd of people gathered together and it actually says some are shouting this, some are shouting that. They've all got their own opinions and thoughts. But it really grabbed my attention that most of the people didn't even know why they were there. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder, in the context of what we're talking about in terms of church, I wonder whether that would be the testimony of some people sitting in churches this morning. We're a part of the crowd and we've gathered, but we don't even really know why we're there. Anyone ever relate to that? I'm sure you're not going to put your hand up here in front of everybody. But... Some people don't even know why they're there. Now, if you don't know why you come to a gathering of believers, what we call church or whatever, if you don't know why you come, then it's going to be very, very hard to have a passion or a, 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 a sense of anticipation about what, what's possible or even a drive to understand the purpose for why do we even do that. And if you don't have a bit of an understanding about that and you don't know why you're there, then, then like most crowds we see, a lot of crowds gather in the Bible that disperse really quickly because they didn't really know why they were there in the first place. So when something happened or something was said they didn't like or whatever, it was easy just to disperse and head off in a different direction. And I just wonder, that phrase, most of the people didn't even know why they were there. 
I wonder how many people have that testimony this morning in the context of our assemblies, which we would call local churches. See, we need to have a conviction about the importance of gathering together. You know, when we were singing those songs, what were you doing? Were you singing songs and trying, you know, some people sing and they listen to their own voice, see if they're in tune and then critique themselves. Jeez, I've got a good voice. My goodness, I hope other people are hearing what I'm hearing. That is fantastic. Anyone like that? No? Or some people, you know, maybe the other way around, you're not really impressed with the sound of your own voice. But do you want, or do you understand that when we gathered this morning and we did that, we're actually, we're, 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 we're fulfilling a command that is scattered and littered right throughout this collection of ancient documents where it says, praise the Lord, glorify God, lift up your voices to heaven. We're fulfilling an ancient commandment to give praise, glory, honour to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one that created the universe, the one that sent his son Jesus to die on a cross so that you and I could be reconnected in relationship to God. We're not just singing songs. Do we understand the purpose of that? Do we understand that's what we're doing? We're not just making a joyful noise. We're not just trying to sing in harmony with everybody else so that, you know, geez, we sound great as a crowd. We're actually worshipping God. We're worshipping God. When, when, when I open up this or, or, or somebody else stands up here and we gather around and we open up this collection of ancient documents, do we understand that we're actually gathering around the Word of God to learn, to have our spirits fed? Jesus said, I think it's uh, was it John 6, 63, uh, a man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then he goes on and he says that the words that I speak to you are spirit in their life. The word of God is not like the, the Northern Star or, or the Daily Telegraph or, or Clio or whatever it is that you're into. And if you're into Clio, don't tell me. But it, whatever it is that you might be into, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's living, it's active. Hebrews 4 says that the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates. It penetrates. It gets inside. It divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow. The word of God judges the thoughts and intentions of our heart. Do we understand there's something going on other than just sitting there listening? to somebody talk to us out of an old, old book? Do we understand when we gather together the power and the opportunity we have to encourage one another in our faith, to stir one another up to love and to good deeds, to call one another up to a better place than the place where maybe we're standing at the moment, to, 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 to push people towards what does God say about that situation? What does God think about that problem? What solution may God have for you in that scenario? What can God do? What is possible when we serve a God who says, I can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can possibly ask or think? Because I'll tell you that, I'm not getting that out there in the other places that I hang out. I don't get that kind of encouragement. Geez, my life sucks. It's going really hard. Don't know what to do. Really? Here, have another beer. Let's, you know. I'm not getting people, one of the, some people that have, have, friends of mine that have come out from South Africa, one of the things that they've told me, I remember sitting down with a, a great South African guy, um, um, uh, Rolof. Remember Rolof used to come, Rolof Venter, some of you would know him, used to come here. And I remember Rolof saying to me one day, I asked him, what's the big difference between being in South Africa and here? He said, well, I worked on the sugarcane farms in South Africa and he said when the tractor would break down, I would go into the boss and say the tractor has broken down and the boss would say, gather the men together, let's pray. And he said they would pray if, if the, something was wrong with the sugar cane. He said we would stop and we would pray, Lord, would you bless this, would you remove? And he said, I come over here now and there's a problem. He said, they ain't praying with me. <laughs> They're not saying, what does the word of God say about that? He said, it's totally, totally different. But when we gather, we get that chance, don't we? To stir one another up. If all you do is come, sit, sing a song, listen to somebody talk, have a coffee, and then walking out the door, you've missed something about the power of getting together. You've missed something about the value of why God wants us to come together. Why is it that Jesus said that, uh, that, that when, when you come, you put your faith in me and, and you're reconnected to God the Father, one of the first things he says he does is when you connect with me, I connect you to others in the form of a body. There's no such thing as lone ranger Christians. There's no such thing as go it alone believers. It's an absolutely foreign concept to anything you'll find in this ancient document or anything that you will find in the history of the early church. You will not find believers going, well, I'm saved now, but I'm not going to connect myself to a bigger body. I'm going to stay over here. It's just me and Jesus, man. 
If me and Jesus, man, was enough, God would not have said to Adam, it's, this is not good. It's you and me. God, Adam, you're there and you've got me all to yourself, but it's not good. They're going to end up weird. And too many Christians end up weird. It's just me and God. I don't need, it's just me and God. I've shared the story before, a good mate of mine. Long story short, decided to go down the path of just him and God. Ended up knocking on the doors of all the pastors in Bundaberg and they'd answer the door and he would say, the Apostle Paul appeared to me last night in a vision and told me to tell you this message. And only a couple of weeks after that, lost his marriage, lost his kids and was wrapped up in a straitjacket and taken to a loony bin. All because he decided one day, I don't need the body. I don't need to go to a fellowship. I don't need to be a part of you guys. I'm just going to lock myself in a room with a tele-evangelist and it began a massive downward spiral that cost him a lot. You and God alone, that's just weird, you know? You, you and me without God, that's, that, 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 that's, that's wearisome. It's tiresome, trying to do everything just in our own strength. But you, me, and God, that's, that's wholeness. That's, that's, that's the intention of God. All of these things are important that we do. Breaking bread, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. I, I know we, we don't break bread, we just break a little seal that makes a, a, a noise and everyone tries to do it really slowly so you don't disturb the person next to you. Just rip the sucker open next time, all right? Okay? And I know that wafer tastes like cardboard. I know it does. And I know that that juice, and I know that if you're a visitor today and you don't normally go to church, that must weird you out. What the heck is going on there? Where on planet Earth do you get a thimble of juice that's watered down and eat a piece of cardboard cut into a square in a circle? And I apologise, but we do it because it reminds us of the body of Jesus that was, was broken for us. He shed his blood on a cross. He gave his life up for us. And when we take communion, we're reminding ourselves of that. I'll guarantee you this, if you, it, 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 how many times in a week does that thought cross your mind? Probably very, very rarely. Let's be honest, we're human beings. Very, very rarely would that thought cross your mind. Hang on, Jesus Christ gave his life for me, was crucified on a cross, dead, buried and raised from the dead three days later for me. But every seven days we take the communion, we do it together as a community and it's a reminder, isn't it? It brings our attention back. Okay, hang on, everything else in life might suck right now. But Jesus died for me. He died for me. And because of that, I have a relationship with the Father. Because of that, one day, whether, whether the, everything that sucks in my life right now gets better or not, one day I'm going to be with the Father in eternity. And there'll be no more tears. And there'll be no more sadness. And there'll be no more fear. And I'll be with him. Amen? So we take communion, all these things that we do when we gather together have a reason, they have a purpose. But if we don't value that and understand that, we can end up just like that group of people that turned up and went, I don't even know why I'm here. Because <laughs> I know why you're not here. You're not here for the coffee. It's terrible coffee. <laughs> Be honest, we've got terrible coffee here. <laughs> but you know what? It's poured with love from a heart of gratefulness. But the coffee sucks, I know that. But it, we, it's good hearted. Nick, Nick makes great coffee. Maybe if we, if we raise money for a coffee machine, maybe Nick can train some coffee people here, yeah? yeah? And I think there might be some coffee people over here too that know coffee, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Get amongst yourselves and get a, get a coffee machine. <laughs> we need to have a conviction about the importance of all these things. So what I want to do today for the little bit of time we've got left, I want to continue our journey into Creado community. And I just want to look at two things real quickly. Number one, how the early church met. And number two, some reasons why the modern church don't. Amen? Why the early church met, how the early church met, and why the modern church don't. So how did the early church gather together? We're going to go and look at some passages in these ancient documents, and the Bible actually talks about church on many different levels, all right? Here's a couple. It talks about meeting in homes. Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. It says, Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea, and to Nympha and the church in her house. So there's a group of people in Colossae that are meeting in the house of a person called Nympha. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. says, The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the what? The church that meets at their house. So here's another passage uh, uh, saying that there was a, a group that was called a church that met in somebody's house. So we know that they met in houses. In, in Philemon chapter 1, verse 2, it also says this, uh, 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 also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. So we know from these ancient documents that people used to meet together in homes. Amen? 
So are house churches biblical? Yeah, I guess they are. Meeting in homes with groups of people? Ah, yes. What size were these churches, by the way? Well, historians will tell you that, that, that a lot of the house churches were somewhere, they could have been anywhere from 50 to 100 people. And, and I, I had a photo, but I can't find it, a photo of one that they found, I think, in Rome, where two people, because they had houses with courtyards, outdoor courtyards, and there was two neighbours that must have both uh, given their lives to Christ, and they actually ripped down the fence in between the two. So it's one massive big courtyard, and they met out there. But they weren't just, sometimes we think house church are just little meetings of five and six people. Some of these were big. And we have evidence that there were, were meetings of up to 100 people in some of these places. But did people meet in homes? Is it biblical to say, I do house church? Yes, definitely. Yes, it is. And then we've also got evidence that they met in places other than homes. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20 and 22. So then, when you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper you eat? So he's talking about a group of believers in Christ saying, when you come together. So there's, a, there's something where you're here, but there's a moment there where you come together. And then verse 22, it says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? So this coming together place he's talking about is not their homes. This is somewhere different. He says, don't you have homes to go and eat and drink in? Yet you're eating and drinking in the Lord's Supper, you're taking it all the wrong way. But, you know, go back to your home and do that. So in other words, the place you're doing this is not in your homes. So there's also evidence, not only did they meet in homes, but we've also got evidence that they met in places other than homes. So is it biblical to meet in homes? Yes. Is it biblical to meet in a place other than your home? Let's say perhaps a place like this. Yes. Yes, it is. There are also meetings where the whole church gathered together. 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church. So in other words, there's a point where the church days in together, but then there's a point where we all come together as a church. He goes on and says, there are divisions among you and so on. How many of you thought that the early church was perfect? Hate to burst that bubble. Just read your Bible, people. <laughs> the stuff they're dealing with kills your toes, some of the stuff, you know? But this is real life because they're real people. And the church is not perfect, and praise God, the church is not perfect. And if you do think that you found a perfect church, don't you dare destroy it by attending. You'll ruin it. Because you're not perfect. Uh, isn't it great that Jesus didn't wait till he found a perfect group of people to spend time with and gather together with? Aren't we glad that Jesus didn't wait until he had 12 perfect people before he decided to pull them together and gather and do the journey of life with them and do the journey of God with them? Aren't we grateful that Jesus didn't wait for perfection? Stop waiting for perfection. No church is perfect. No Lions Club is perfect. No pub is perfect, no football club is perfect, no soccer club is perfect, no workplace is perfect, no school is perfect. Stop having a different standard for the church. No church is perfect. God is perfect, but we're not. Amen? So the whole church gathers together. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and he goes on and says, that, you know, inquirers and unbelievers are going to think, wow, that's kind of weird and freaky. But again, he says, when the whole church comes together, so we've got evidence here that there were churches that met in homes and smaller groups, and there's evidences, moments where the whole church actually came together in places outside of homes. We've also got acknowledgement that home meetings and large temple meetings both took place in the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Every day. Some people struggle thinking, oh, I've got to go, I've got to, go to church one day a week for an hour. Oh, it sucks. I haven't got time. Mate, these suckers did it every day. Hey? You want to see what they saw? Miracles, signs, wonders, healings? I want to see it. Well, these guys lived a certain way. Their commitment to God and to one another was a certain type of commitment. I want to see that stuff. Well, if I want to see it, I've got to be it. Amen? I've got to be it. I can't sit back and think that God will just do it. God's not, I'm not waiting for God. God's sitting there, I believe, waiting for us. Going, be the people I called you to be. Be the people that I died for. Be the church that I said. The gates of hell will not be able to push against you. Because there's something about you. Something about you. Acts 5, 42. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching, proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So here's the point. There's no set model that anyone can claim is biblical for church. Amen? There's no one set model. Now, I, I, I've, I've been in, in, in big churches and little churches and even a part of house church movements. And what disappoints me is everybody thinks that they're doing the one and only right way to do it. 
I'm thinking, well, you would have to have taken a big marker and scratched a lot of passages out of here to come to that conclusion. But if you're not going to take a marker and you're going to actually read what's in here, guess what? There is no set model for how you do this thing we call church. There's no set model. No set model. I remember being in, uh, I got a mate of mine, he's part of a house church movement in Brisbane, and I remember him giving me books, piles of books, to try to convince me that, no, 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 the way that you guys are doing it is wrong. It's got to be in houses. Got, and I thought, look, I agree with everything you're saying. But, you, but, you, but, but there's nothing you're saying that tells me the other way of doing it is wrong. In fact, I can show you biblically where there are so many different ways to do it. That's before we even look at the cultural implications of what they were allowed to do and weren't allowed to do back then what was safe and what was unsafe, what was wise and what was unwise. Amen? So there's no biblical way to do church. But here's some things we can claim. We can claim that Jesus assumed that his followers would gather together. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 17. This is really interesting. And if Jesus is not assuming that we gather together, then this makes absolutely no sense. He says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now what he's saying is the other people you're taking along have got to be people that have observed and noticed whatever this thing is too. Otherwise, they're not going to be a great witness. All they're doing is, no, well, he, he said, no, 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 we've observed too. So he's then saying if, if approaching that person one-on-one doesn't work, take some other people that have observed the same behaviour or whatever it is, take them along. So that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Then watch this. If they still refuse to listen, he says, tell it to the church. <sighs> that would suck, wouldn't it? Imagine that. Huh? Rod, you better pick your act up a little bit, brother. You might be the first one. <laughs> he says, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, by the way, by the way, Jesus loved pagans and tax collectors, didn't he? He's not saying kick them out and treat them with disgust and ignore them and ostracise them. What he's saying is, you know, pagans and tax collectors, they didn't get platforms, positions of authority and influence within the church, but they were welcome. They were welcome. So don't take that to an extreme and say that Jesus is saying we treat them like dirt. Hey, he loved tax gatherers and sinners, man. But you just don't give them positions of influence, power, authority and so on. That's, that's the point that he's making there. But here's the thing. He's talking about take it to a church. He's not talking about the church universal because most of the people universally would go, I don't even know who that person is. Don't know what you're talking about. If somebody from Centre Church was disciplining someone and brought them up here and said, right, this person here, they've been doing it and I'm bringing it to the church, we'd all sit there and go, I have no clue what you're talking about. I don't know that person. I have no relationship with that person. No observations of that person. What are you talking about? So he's obviously talking about and assuming that people would be gathering in smaller assemblies and groups where they actually knew each other. They did life together. They journeyed together. So Jesus assumed that his followers would actually gather together. You can make your pick. Is it in a house? Is it in a building? I don't care. I just know that Jesus is making an assumption that there's going to be an assembly of my believers together. We can also claim that the early church did this regularly. They met together. We know that. Acts chapter 20 verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people because he intended to leave them. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money. Revelation 1, 10. On the Lord's Day, I was in the Spirit. There was a day called the Lord's Day and it was the first day of the week. Is it Saturday? Is it Sunday? I don't care. The point is, it was a regular occurrence. Each week, they had some time set aside where they gathered together to worship God, to, to get into his word, to fellowship together, to stir one another on, to love and good works, to encourage one another. They made it a part of their life. Not, a, not an add-on if we have time. It was a part of their world. This is, if you don't agree with me, then, then, then don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what I find in this collection of ancient documents. And the other thing is we can claim that while the church was universal, it was also acknowledged as being individual and local. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Paul says this to the Philippians. He says, As you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you. In other words, lots of different churches. You were the only church that financially contributed to the mission that I was on at the time. That's not necessarily a bagging of the other churches. Every church has its own flavour, its own style, its own emphasis, things that it it does really well, outreaches it does in a community. They're all different churches. are like Baskin and Robbins and everybody loves Baskin and Robbins. Don't we? We love the different flavours that are available. Well, the church has different flavours. 
Find a flavour and dive into the bucket. Amen? Find a flavour. There's plenty of different styles and types and so on. You know, I, I, loved, I think I told you a couple of weeks ago, I can tell you that things that I hear here, I've been told that I preach too long, been told that I preach too short, been told I'm too many Bible verses, been told I don't have enough Bible verses, been told I use too many jokes, been told I'm not funny enough. I've been told just about everything you can possibly think of to the point where I don't know who I actually am anymore. But if you don't like it, that's okay, because if you want shorter, longer, more verse, there'll be something out there. There's a flavour out there. Dive into the bucket. Get into it. Go for it. Amen? Don't sit and be critical. Find your flavour and get into it. Dive into it. Swim around with a whole bunch of other people. Get to know them. Be a part of that community and make a difference with your life for the kingdom of God. Amen? Okay. Billy Graham said this once. He said, Christian fellowship is not optional. It's essential. It's commanded. Saying I'm a member of the great universal church, but I don't go to any fellowship is like saying I'm in the Navy, but I don't go on any ship. Touche, Billy Graham. Okay, quickly. So, second thing. Why don't we want to gather anymore? I just want to finish by answering five common excuses that you'll hear from people as to why they don't want to attend or engage with a local fellowship. And here they are. Number one, I've been hurt by the church. You ever heard that? I've been hurt by the church. I completely understand that. Because the church... On one hand, I understand that. Because, yes, the church has done some dumb things. But let me strip that back to its bare bones. Have I personally hurt you? Has, has Rod personally hurt you? What about Jenny? Has Jenny personally hurt you? Well, hang on, you said the church. Hang on, what you mean is some individual people within the church have hurt you, I mean. And guess what? I'm very sorry about that, but it's going to happen. But don't use that as an excuse to not join yourself or engage with a community of faith because the church hurt me. The church never hurt you. Individuals hurt you. Don't broad brush and blanket the entire church. You have not been hurt by the entire church of Jesus Christ universally or even within your own community or even within that, uh, that one fellowship that you're a part of. The church doesn't hurt people. Individuals hurt individuals. Amen? So next time someone says you, I've been hurt by the church, help them see, hey, hang on, it's not the church. It's amazing that when people are hurt by the church, they, how many people get hurt by the church? They ditch God. I've never understood that one either. Okay, the church is imperfect and it does things wrong, but Jesus is perfect. It doesn't matter how I treat you, what mistakes I make, or how I hurt you, Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago still was crucified on a cross, still buried, still resurrected, and you still have to acknowledge whether that was done for you or not, regardless of whether I'm perfect or I hurt or offend or whatever. Amen? Our faith doesn't rest on whether the church is perfect. It rests on a moment in human history. Jesus Christ crucified, buried, resurrected. Did it happen? Yes or no? That's what your faith rests upon. The rest of it's secondary. The rest of it's secondary. Now, number one, I've been hurt by the church. Second one, why people don't want to attend or engage, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. You know what? We do live in a very, very busy world, but at the same time, and I've said this before, we also live in a world where things get done quicker than they've ever been done before. You get to church in a car in five minutes, great, 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 great grandparents took two hours in an ox cart, whatever, to get there. But they did it. You boil water for coffee in about 60 seconds, you flick a switch. Not only do you do that while it's boiling, you walk away and do a whole bunch of other things. Come back, the water's boiled. Or in some cases, with your fancy coffee people machines, you press a button, walk away, you don't even have to add milk, sugar, nothing, you just press a button, walk away, come back, there's my latte. Hey, once upon a time, people actually had to boil it over water, then get a tea bag and dip it and then get the sugar, and it was a whole process. It was like a camping trip. Had to have a manual to make a coffee. Now you just push a button. Everything's a little bit quicker. Once upon a time, they had to catch the chicken, pull the feathers out of the chicken, bleed the chicken, cut the chicken up, you know. <laughs> now we just go, Bleep! swipe a card and go home, there's my chicken. Microwave or oven, whatever it is that you do, but you walk away. Please, 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 I know that life is busy right now, but let's not use that as an excuse for why we can't engage with a community of faith. Because you know what? Life is maybe in one hand, we may think it's busy, but the truth is if we narrow it back down, we're not more busy, we're just more distracted. We're more distracted with so many other things. Once upon a time, your great-great-great-grandparents probably had four things in their life. They, had, they loved their family, their wife and their kids. Uh, they went to work and maybe they served in their church. And maybe went to the pub every Friday, Saturday afternoon for a couple of beers and a, whatever. 
Life was simple, three or four things in their life. Most of us today, we've got 30 things in our life we're trying to juggle. We're not busy, we're just more distracted. Take away 25 of them. Get rid of 25 of them that actually don't mean anything and just really press into the five things that really matter. Your family, your faith, your friends, whatever. Press into that and you'll probably find that you do actually have a bit of time. So when people say I'm too busy, I think, you know what, here's the thing. When I got my job at Dan Murphy's, right? When I was a manager at Dan Murphy's, the day I walked in for the interview, I made this declaration to them. I said, here's the deal. I play touch football. It's, it's my outlet. It's my mental health thing uh, and I've, I, I, I play it representative levels and all sorts of things and I just need you to know Wednesday nights I play in my local comp I will not work Wednesday nights they went no worries that's fine but I went straight in there you know why I did that because it was a priority to me it was just simply a priority to me I said I'm, I'm having this time and I realise at the end of the day when I lay my head down here's the reality I get angry and frustrated anyone like me you get frustrated because you look back and go I didn't get to achieve anything I didn't do it. anyone like that or was that just me just me is it right yeah okay it was just me but sometimes I lay there at night and I'm, I'm frustrated because I didn't get to do that and I wanted to achieve that today and, just, and I didn't. Da, da, da. And it all comes back to me eventually calming myself down and going, yeah, but Alan, today was just the sum total of whatever you prioritised. And I can't argue with myself because it's right. Okay, yeah, no, you're right. I could have done that. I just had to get rid of that. And most of the time, the end of my day is the sum total of whatever I chose to prioritise for those 18 hours I was awake. I can't escape it. So I'm too busy. Eh. Look at your priorities. How important is it to be with other believers, to worship corporately, to get into the word of God together, to be a part of something a little bigger than yourself, to be able to do something. You can't do everything, but you can do something to contribute to the bigger mission of God. You've got to ask yourself, where is that on my priority list? And be honest with ourselves about it. Let's not lie about it. Too many Christians, I think, we, we, we feel like the way around God is just lie to ourselves. God sees your heart anyway. He knows the truth anyway, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. And if he's not number one, that's okay. Go to him and say, you know what, Lord, I know that you should be, but the truth is you're not. God, help me. Give me wisdom. How do I, how do I deal with this? How do I change this, Lord? Go to God. I've been hurt by the church. Number two, I'm too busy. Number three, I'm part of the universal church. Ever heard that one? I'm just part of the universal church. I don't need to commit anywhere. You know, let, let, me, let me tell you what's really hard about that. It's really, really hard for me as your pastor to know whether you're part of this church or the universal church. Who do I care for? Who do I put my time and energy and resource into? And by the way, biblically, we have an instruction on this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 to 2, it says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. How can I care for the flock if I don't know who's under my care? You ever thought about that from a pastoral perspective? I used to go to a church years ago. I was an associate pastor. And our senior pastor used to always be saying to me, can you contact that person? I haven't seen them for two months. Are they still coming here or not? And I used to think, you're a jerk. Because you should just love them all and care for them all anyway. But then I realised when I became a senior pastor, hang on a second, you've only got X amount of time and resource and personnel and so on. And if I've got to care for the flock that's under my care, I need to know who's placed themselves under our care so I can care for those people and prioritise those people. Otherwise, I'm not fulfilling my biblical commandment as a pastor to care for the people that are under my flock. And people go, I go a bit here and a bit there, a bit here, a bit there. That's fine. But in your time of crisis or time of need, when you need caring, who cares for you? Who's, who's, who's the leader that has the responsibility, the, the pastoral team that have the responsibility? Where have you connected yourself in? It gets very hard. But right here, I see this admonition Peter writing saying, no, 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 hang on. There is a flock that has been placed under your care. And that's who you're responsible to care for. So whose care are you under? Which flock do you connect yourself to we're all part of the universal church but we're also meant to be connected to a local body somewhere somehow number three i'm part of the universal church number four i don't like organized religion who's ever heard that one i don't like organized religion do you like disorganized religion is that what you mean seriously think about it what a dumb statement i don't like organized religion what the heck does that even mean Okay, uh, what day do you want to meet next week, Kevin? Okay. What day do you want to meet next week? Let's do a rock, paper, scissors, see who wins. We'll okay. just pick it. Hey? 
How ridiculous. I remember distinctly Jesus walking around with a big crowd and then one, at one moment calling 12 people out of that. It sounded like he was organising something, didn't it? It sounded like he was doing a bit of organising. I go back to Genesis and it sounds to me like God was pretty organised when he created things. I'm going to do this, then this, then this, then this. I'm going to, I've got this, some organisation about God. And when there's chaos, it's usually because God brings a little bit of chaos to shake it up so he can bring the right order, the right organisation to things. Ephesians 4 says that God gave the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip this. It sounds like something's being organised there. It doesn't matter which way we look at it. You cannot read this collection of ancient documents and go, well, God, with this, our religion is this disorganised religion. Paul goes and plants churches and everywhere after he plants them, he goes back and he appoints leaders and leadership structures and so on. What is this stupid statement, I don't like organised religion? What does it even mean? It sounds crazy. I like disorganised religion. Well, I'm sorry. There's nothing about Christianity that's disorganised. And the truth is, you don't like disorganised religion. Because if you turned up next Sunday at 10 o'clock thinking there was going to be a service here and we just did a paper, rock, scissors and just decided we're going to do some other time, some other place, didn't tell you when or where, because it's just disorganised. And you should love that though, because you hate organised religion. No, you're going to get angry, aren't you? You're going to get frustrated. Oh, by the way, do you remember that story where Paul preached uh, in the book of Acts? I think it might be Acts 19, 20 maybe. Paul's preaching at night, 22. And there was a boy sitting in the window. Do you remember that one? Boy sitting in the window and Paul kept preaching all night and he fell out the window. Remember that? Don't whinge because I preached for 40 minutes. This guy, he preached all night and the sucker fell asleep and fell out the window. Hey? But it's okay because it's Paul. He goes down there, prays him, God jumps up. I probably, don't fall out a window on me. I probably, I'm not backing myself in for that one. You know? Disorganised religion. It's, isn't it ridiculous? Some of these excuses and reasons that we use. Religion is organised. Life is organised. Your work is organised. Your day is organised. Your house is organised. Eh? Your family is organised to a certain degree. <laughs> Unless you've got little kids. It's just organised chaos. Uh, organisation. Okay, and the last one. And I hear this a bit too. I don't go to church because I don't get anything out of it. I don't get anything out of it. Well, if your shadow is healing the sick, then I'm with you, I agree. Anyone's shadow healing the sick right here? Remember that story? Peter, walking along and it just said even his shadow touched people and they were healed. Let me tell you this, my shadow ain't healing sick people yet. So I kind of feel like I've got a way to go. I feel like I've got some things to learn. I feel like there's elements of my relationship with God that need to be tweaked. I feel like I don't fully understand how a God in heaven could love a person like me. I feel like I don't fully understand how I'm called to love people like you. I'm not there yet, and neither are you. So when people say, I don't get anything out of it, I think, no, you do. But here's the key to getting something out of it. Getting something out of it is a byproduct of what you give. We don't come to a gathering together to get. What do you want to get out of worship? Or do you want to give something to God? Why do you worship? You want, you want, are you worshipping so God gives to you? Or is genuine worship about us giving to God? Amen? Yeah? It's about giving to God, isn't it, when we, when we gather together. Here's the thing. Here's the passage that most pastors will use to manipulate you to come to church on Sunday. Hebrews chapter 10, you all know it. Hebrews 10, verse 24 to 25. But I'll just flip it just a little bit. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, and even to this day, some are in the habit of doing it. They're just in the habit of doing it. They just don't prioritise it. It's not that important to them. He says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Watch this. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Here's the interesting thing about that. You cannot read that passage and think that the writer of Hebrews is saying, you need to come along because you're going to get something out of it. Everything about that passage says you need to come along because you've got to give something. But here's the thing, if everybody's giving, then somebody's getting, aren't they? Yeah. Amen? It's like this, if I can use the Lion King, it's the circle of life. The circle of life. You know that? Because if everybody turns up and does exactly what the writer of Hebrews says, turn up, encourage one another, spur one another on to love and good deeds. If everybody's doing that, then everybody's giving, and everyone's giving, then everyone's also receiving at the same time. Getting out of the life and community of faith, what you get is a byproduct of what you give. And if you're not a giver, 
And I'm, I'm talking in, in various, every area of giving, coming along on a Sunday going, Lord, when I get there today, I'm going to contribute something. I'm not preaching, I'm not leading the worship, but I'm going to be with about 80 other believers or however many people turn up that Sunday, I'm going to be with them. There are going to be needs, there are problems, there are questions that need answering, there's people that need encouragement, people need to be spurred on to love and good works, and God, I want to be your man or your woman to do that. God, here I am, and when I get there, I'm ready to give. If we all came with that attitude, what a different environment could a Sunday morning be for communities that gather together? Amen? A lot of people kind of staring blankly at me this morning. That's okay. I don't mind. Don't shout me down. This is a good message, this one. I'm going to send myself an offering after this. You watch. Buy myself a fishing rod, say, Jackie, I earned that. Let's pray, people. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, God. I want to thank you for this uh, community. Of faith, God, I want to thank you for every community of faith across our region, Lord. We have some fantastic churches in this region, Lord. And, and this morning as they meet, God, would you bless all of those communities, bless the pastors, the leaders, Lord. Would you bless uh, the people there that, uh, God, give them uh, creative ways to serve, God, creative ways to reach into their community, Father. God, uh, Lord, move upon your people in this region. Lord. Let us be a whole bunch of people that, that come along in order to give, not just to get. And Father, we, we read about this movement called The Way, and there's no doubt that it almost looks like a totally different group to a lot of what we're experiencing and seeing now. But Lord, you have not changed. You have not changed, and I'll be humble enough myself to say I know I have. So Father, we just pray, would you, uh, God, continue to take us on this journey, Lord? What does it mean to be church the way that you envisioned it when you hung upon that cross when you said you would build your church you had a vision and a picture in your mind lord let us see that picture let us catch that vision lord for what it means to be that group of people in a local community in Ginelabar in 2022 2023 and beyond and lord i pray for the next seven days father as we leave this place there are going to be people we come into contact with they don't know you lord they have no hope They've got questions, they need answers, and you are the ultimate answer, Lord. God, would you bring us across their path, and would you give each of us the opportunity to tell somebody this week about the goodness of God, Lord. Somebody out there that up to this point doesn't know how loved they are by you, doesn't know how special they are, doesn't know what you did for them. God, give us a chance to share that great message with somebody this week, and we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.